uh, Rakeeb, it's great to have you on the show. Now, the reason I summoned you here today is because you wrote a brilliant piece in The Telegraph yesterday, um, all about DEI. Uh, and this is all about Angela Rayner's new sort of woke new work laws and uh, diversity and whatever it is, inclusion and whatever the other uh, letter in the acronym is all about. Tell us about this. Tell us why this stuff is so dangerous. Well, first, Alex, I make the point that there's certain provisions in this uh, employment rights bill, which the government is billing as the biggest upgrade in uh, workers' rights for a generation. Uh, that I support. They're quite family friendly in nature. For example, the introduction of parental and uh, bereavement leave from day one, stronger dismissal related protections for uh, new mothers um, and th those who are currently pregnant. And also that there's also some very interesting and very important provisions there, um, which are very much pro family. Um, in my view, such as uh, flexible family friendly working becoming the norm where practical. But where I take issue uh, with this employment rights bill is that it is ultimately looking to usher in this era of diversity, equity and inclusion on steroids. And I'll give you one example where you have uh, union representatives, equality union representatives, they would be able to take time off work to participate in equality training with their accommodation costs being covered by their employers and that the employers would be legally mandated to do so. So while I tr support the more traditional minded um, elements of the Employment Rights Bill, I think that there are those DEI elements, which I think that will not only be very financially costly, but quite socially divisive as well. Yeah, so let's talk about it being socially divisive. By the way, I love your uh, pro-natalist stuff. I've always been a big believer in this. I've wondered for a long time, when you get massive new developments and office blocks, they've always got their coffee cart downstairs, mm. they've got the underground parking, they've usually got a gym attached to them or a roof terrace with a bar on it and I'm like where's the crash Absolutely. All right? where's the crash um, but uh, let's talk about this equality training the DEI nonsense what is, mm. I mean what on earth does that even include you talk about it being divisive and dangerous which I agree with but let's drill down into that like what why is this stuff such brain rot well I think that one of the problems for me is that it's overly focused on race and religion uh, in particular, and I think that's a real problem because firstly, we live in a country where race and religion, religious belief, they're both enshrined as protected characteristics in existing equalities legislation to begin with. And if you compare us to other European countries, including EU member states such as France, Germany and the Netherlands, we outperform them when it comes to providing anti-discrimination protections on the grounds of race, ethnicity and religion. And if you look at a variety of studies, those who have a very strong religious identity, the, the majority generally say that they're quite happy with how their employers accommodate for their faith-related beliefs and their religious practices. So I think that there's many DEI activists who, in my view, they're wholly unproductive, not particularly uh, efficient. And I just have to understand, I, I, I struggle to understand what purpose they actually serve. So I think that I have a very serious problem with ex exactly this kind of activist being empowered in the Employment Rights Bill. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that's sort of become a trendy uh, equality training asset in uh, recent mm. years is the concept of uh, unconscious bias training. And uh, so I was musing on this quietly inside my own skull the other day, and I kind of came to the conclusion that, like it or not, right, there, there's, there is unconscious bias. I think kind of being a little bit racist is part of the human condition. It's sort of wired into us tribally as an animal species to sort of want mm. to protect our own and be suspicious of others. And I think that you can't erase that. Um, yet I've always thought that the idea of either constantly pointing at it actually makes it a thing. It scares it up into existence where most of the time it naturally finds a way of erasing itself when people are gossiping around the water cooler. You know, when people are sharing a space and uh, in the same environment doing the same things and actually working together that is the best way of actually mm. resolving those issues rather than pointing at it my other fear about this and it, it sort of goes into um safety right and especially when it's taught to kids uh, and the protection of women in particular or vulnerable people i've often wondered you know 
there are so many stories now of, uh, of young girls being approached by older gentlemen, older men, I won't call them gentlemen, they don't deserve that title, who, um, you know, sort of uh, want to uh, take advantage of them, let's say. And I think that girls especially need that gut instinct of fear sometimes, of thinking, I'm not sure if I trust this person. Uh, so, yeah, I just want to get your thoughts on that. That was just, sorry, that was just sort of me, my brain's contents just coming out of my mouth. But I think the idea of this unconscious element is, is so dangerous. I think it is so harmful. No, absolutely. And, and I, th I think the reality is that I don't think it's necessarily the most productive way in terms of trying to create and foster a more inclusive workforce. And I think that quite often is it's, it's very much a tick box exercise. Many employers put up this unconscious bias training. They they use it in a way to portray themselves as truly inclusive. And I think that the elements of the Employment Rights Bill, which are quite pro-family, I think that's a step in the right direction. But I think there have been many businesses for far too long. They've ignored taking that kind of action themselves in terms of providing employees with better rights in that capacity. But ultimately, what you're referring to there is that, that we all have our certain prejudices. And I think that it's just better to be honest about that. And the key is, is how you manage those prejudices. I think that's the important thing. Uh, I think that also in, in the workforce, I think that we, ha we do have certain problems, in my view, in terms of very problematic relations between those males who hold very powerful positions and their relationship with certain junior female workers. Um, I think that, that that needs to be discussed a lot more and I think that needs to be stamped out in certain industries. And I think that is traditional, classic, conventional women's rights. Let's be very clear about that. But I think that when you live in a society which is struggling to define what a woman even is, it's very difficult to make headway on that front. Yeah, you know, you, you bring up something very close to my heart. People always say, what happened to you at GB News? Well, I'm not allowed to say because I'm under an NDA, but I think Rakib just nudged upon uh, something that uh, is close to my heart there. Now, talking about these natalist policies, is there, do you think, any risk, actually, that there is a sort of a side effect of this where mm. all of a sudden women of a certain age, because employers will think, blimey, they're going to get maternity rights from day one, that they're just going to say, I, I just don't want to take the risk of employing her at all. I think that I think that that's a perfectly legitimate point uh, to raise. But I think actually, if you if you look here, when it comes to paternity leave more generally, uh, we lag well behind l most of Europe, Alex, uh, on that front, especially. Um, countries in Northern Europe. And I don't think that's sustainable. Now, of course, I think more generally, when you're talking about pro-natalist policies, we also have to be honest that m m many of the reasons why we have depressed birth rates, they're very much social and cultural in nature, whether that's for the fast paced secularization, the prioritization of individual freedom. So we need to be honest about that. But for a long time, I do think that we need to have more family friendly workers rights in the UK. We need a more pro family settlement specifically for younger British workers. Yeah, I mean, I, I couldn't, I couldn't agree more. And like I said, my, I just think the first thing that would be very useful is more crash spaces close to offices. Absolutely. I mean, Absolutely. you know, I think if most women thought they could come to work with the baby, leave the baby upstairs under the care of professionals, and do a day's work, pop up at, you know, a, a mid morning break, pop up at a lunchtime break, take the baby home again, that that would be far better than that woman having to find a nursery place somewhere, get to that place, pay a load of money for it, then get to the office. Then if something goes wrong, they've got to leave the office to go back to that nursery and you know it's just higgledy piggledy it's almost as if the idea of propagating the human race is brand new designed and taboo and terrible and such a hindrance when actually if we didn't do that there would be no humans Rakib thank you ever so much I always love catching up with you Dr Rakib Essan there